You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and indeed beyond and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. And next up on the program is old friend of the network, even though he hasn't been on, at least in person, in a while. We did have him on virtually about a year ago, but I'm pleased to be joined once again by John Davidson, the CEO over there, the Options Clearing Corporation. John, welcome back to the network. Welcome back to in person. You and I haven't done this in, oh, three years in person? It's fabulous to be back, and uh, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate all the things you do for our industry and particularly for market participants. Well, I appreciate your appreciation, sir. Thank you very much. But, yes, there's a lot to catch up on. Uh, You and I chatted virtually last February. That's the last time we've really checked in with OCC. And, uh, obviously, last year, a bit of a a wild, crazy, unprecedented – pick your adjective of choice, and it probably applies to last year. So let's start there. Catch us up from your perspective running OCC during – what was arguably the craziest year in the options market history. <laughs> Catch us up there. What were some of your thoughts? What, what was it like over the course of the past year for you folks over there at OCC? Well, it's interesting that, uh, as you say, the most wild and crazy year in the history of uh, the almost 50-year history of uh, exchange-traded options happens while <clears throat> we and a large segment of the industry are all working remotely. Um, and that's really a testimony to – Uh, the work we've done to prepare and the work our colleagues throughout the industry have done to prepare for that. Uh, Certainly, we had uh, record volume in uh, 2021 and very happy with that. We also set a record uh, open interest. More than 500 million contracts of uh, options were open at a point in time in October of last year. Total uh, 9.93, just shy of uh, 10 billion options contracts uh, traded. We seem to be on a pretty good uh, path for uh, 2022. Probably not necessarily right at that record level, but if you think about April of 2022, the month we just got through, compare it to uh, 20 years ago in uh 2002, which is when I first went on the uh, board of directors of the Options Clearing Corporation uh, representing Morgan Stanley, we traded the same amount of volume in the entire year, uh, about 790 million contracts in 2002 that we traded in the month of April. So while certainly a lot of conditions in the marketplace have changed, and I think that's uh, another important characteristic of the need for options education, we have a whole generation of investors who haven't really seen a bear market, haven't really seen uh, inflation um, as the predominant characteristic of the U.S., if not the global economy. So all of these changes, people really need to understand these instruments are risk transfer instruments. They have their own inherent risks that you need to understand. 
We've been making a lot of investments at OCC, uh, of course, first and foremost, to make sure that we can handle the capacity uh, that the industry throws at us. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, conference we're at because there's always uh, an introductory, what's the market doing these days? And the volume in the options industry looks like a hockey stick over the last two years. It's truly remarkable how much it's increased. We have a 22-year-old clearing system at OCC, but it is very, very resilient and hasn't had any problems handling the capacity whatsoever. We've been previously focused, of course, on how we manage the risk in the market as a whole. And I would say one of the things that changed most dramatically in 2021, not that it hadn't happened before in history, because there's certainly a number of uh, prior incidents like the um, the the boom uh, in technology stocks uh, around the turn of the century and things like that. But idiosyncratic risks of particular instruments, the so-called MEM stocks, uh, but a variety of stocks, uh, single name equity options, uh, growth really uh, expands dramatically. Uh, growth in exchange-traded funds expands dramatically. And how our margin rules and our, our, our margin models handle those tremendous changes in uh, volatility in particular um, have been been very well tested in 2021. We continue to make investments of the, in those models, obviously subject to regulatory approval for the changes. But I would say overall, the industry uh, in general and OCC in particular came through 2021 very well. And we're now in some, in at least recent history, relatively unprecedented times. We've seen uh, a, a lot of um, uh, very dramatic changes in uh, levels of the market, both uh, uh, individually and collectively. And I, I think we're well positioned for that. Oh, a lot to unpack there, John. I think we'll start right where we left off pretty much last time you and I chatted. It was February of last year. We were just in the infancy, the early days of what would come to be known, as you mentioned, the, the, the meme stock explosion. Uh, we were seeing, it seemed like almost on a daily basis, things occurring in the marketplace that we were taught that when I first walked on the floor were probably impossible or at least highly, highly improbable. Things like large trading names going up to a thousand percent implied volatility and trading there for sustained periods of time. So it seemed like every day we were we were getting something new, something unprecedented thrown at us. And for you on the clearing side, it must have been equally challenging. So walk us through that year. As we look back now, we have a whole year behind us of this meme stock explosion. Were there any interesting takeaways or maybe lessons learned or just surprises you had on the clearing side. You said, wow, we never anticipated that unfolding the way that it did that you can now look at and learn from going forward. Well, I don't think there were any uh, unpleasant surprises per se. Um, I think the industry handled the increase in volume and the volatility very well. Um, I think we need to be careful about making sure that all the new investors in these products have a good understanding that the market does both go up and go down and that uh, you have to understand the positions that you're putting on uh, a little more uh, rigorously than maybe people thought when uh, it seemed that the market only went in, in one direction, which is generally perceived to be positive. Um, at the OCC, of course, we have had uh, very high levels of volatility, but again, um, a fair amount of uh, variability in that volatility. So it's not like the entire market is volatile all of the time, but there are certainly uh, particularly single stock options where the the mix and, as you mentioned, the um, – the so-called theoretically challenging levels of volatility uh, changed fairly dramatically. But again, uh, because we have a, a risk system that's based on uh, stress testing and looking at uh, extreme but at least plausible uh, changes in levels of price, 
we were well prepared to, to handle those. And it would appear that our clearing members have been well prepared to handle those. So um, I, I think that's uh, certainly good news. The other thing that is very important to understand is the uh, the role of the capital markets in the U.S. In the last two years, there have been 15, more than 1,500 new issues, new um, initial public offerings and derivatives of initial public offerings box uh, that have come to market. And we have options on a very large number of those uh, IPOs. So it's very clear that the uh, capital markets in the U.S. are responding to all the developments in the economy, the new opportunities that uh, entrepreneurs have to uh, develop new ideas, bring them to market, see if they succeed, and if they succeed, uh, bring them to the public capital markets. And the options markets really support all of that activity. We need to make sure that that uh, persists both from our role as sort of the foundation of secure markets, providing the infrastructure, the plumbing that most people don't pay much attention to for most of the time unless something breaks. Uh, nothing broke in 2021, and uh, don't have any expectation that it'll break in in 2022 based on what we've seen so far. Yeah, the offensive lineman of the options market. When they call out your name, it's usually because of something bad. Right? That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, well, one of those one of those things I wanted to touch on a little bit, and uh, the risks you mentioned earlier, John, because there was interesting debate that emerged particularly within this audience, the industry and institutional audience last year, which kind of surprised me. And I wanted to get you, your take on it a little bit. When we saw this massive wave of retail coming into the marketplace, for the most part, they were doing one trade, which was buying calls on whatever name it was. It was very one-sided paper over and over again, which led to these explosions and call volatility and upside crashes and all these names. And we started to hear this persistent drumbeat right around the time you and I chatted last, February of last year, that, you know what, maybe we're doing this wrong. Maybe we're systematically as an industry pricing call options wrong because they were never designed, our models were never designed in the wake of this massive influx of new demand for one type of trade and one type of trade only. And so I started to hear a persistent drumbeat from people, even very sophisticated people in the industry. You know what? Maybe we need to rethink the way that we are pricing call options in the wake of this tidal wave of new options paper. Obviously, you over there at OCC, you mentioned your risk models. You're kind of the risk modeler in chief for the industry over there. I'm curious for your perspective. You had no major issues, so it sounds like everything worked out from that perspective. But what are your thoughts on that debate? And were you surprised like I was that it was as heated and as contentious and as widespread as it was that we as an industry were perhaps doing it wrong, John? Yeah, I don't buy into that argument uh, particularly well, I'm afraid. Um, it, it is true that we had a, uh, a strong per predominance of retail investors in, in call options. Um, on the other hand, uh, protection of puts was uh, – seen as an important thing, particularly for institutional investors, uh, making sure they could uh, hedge uh, their exposures in, in a number of areas. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, this past couple of months has changed, I think, the orientation uh, of the market and people are starting to think about more defensive strategies. At the end of the day, we're really not the uh, the risk managers and the arbiters of prices. Um, that's the options market makers. Unlike the cash equity market where really the marketplace is bringing buyers and sellers together, and the options markets virtually – uh, well over 90% of the retail order flow has a market maker, a professional market maker, dominated by um, half a dozen or a dozen uh, large firms who are dedicating the capital. Who are, I mean, we now have uh, 1,600,000 <clears> <throat> different strike prices and options. And the market makers are obliged to make markets in that entire portfolio for the most part. So they are really setting uh, the prices in response to what's happening in, in the marketplace. And I think they do a, a very good job of that. And they have uh, 
the the intellectual and the technology horsepower to uh, make those markets in a, in a pretty continuous basis. Now we're starting to talk about uh, more 24-hour trading in the options industry. It's a really interesting emerging topic. Um, <clears throat> it's somewhat straightforward, I think, for index options and some of the uh, big name um, uh, exchange traded funds, options on exchange traded funds. It's a bit more challenging if you think about 24 hour trading on uh, single name options, options on specific securities where the underlier may not trade during uh, all of those 24 hours. But I, I think the, you know, the markets are efficient. They're not 100% efficient, but they are quite efficient. And the market makers uh, just do an awesome job. There is strong competition among market makers. If they were mispricing things in a, in a systematic way, uh, the market simply would not operate and we wouldn't see the kind of volume that we've seen in 2021 and, and year to date in 2022. Well, you mentioned extended hours trading, John. There are two questions I am legally obligated to ask you whenever you come on, John, because our audience asks me so often that I have to relay them to you. One of them is along those lines. It seems like usually at this time of year during earnings seasons when we receive this inquiry the most, but a lot of particularly new traders to the options market, they look at stocks, they see after hours in stocks, and then they look at options around earnings and they say, why isn't there an after hours or extended hours session? for options. You mentioned we are starting to see some pushes towards that. What are your thoughts overall on extending those hours, whether it's in single names or in the indexes? Do you think we're heading there anytime soon? And perhaps are there any unintended consequences that may have on the marketplace going forward? Well, I think, um, you know, a number of the exchanges have had uh, slightly extended trading hours, particularly for index options for some time now. Uh, they are not wildly successful. I mean, certainly if you compare the, uh, if you will, overnight after the close options volume to what we see in stock index futures and other uh, U.S. futures contracts, uh, our numbers pale in comparison to those. But I think there's more and more appetite for in the <clears throat> in the index option area in particular uh, in ETFs like the SPY. Uh, to trade longer hours. Uh, we're, we're moving to a, or, or at least we have a commitment to move to a T plus one settlement environment for uh, cash equities uh, a couple of years away. Uh, a lot of work to be done. Obviously, options have settled T plus one uh, since inception in 1973, but it's a huge transition. And I think as the... Uh, International participants in our markets become more sophisticated and more um, active. They want to have uh, some availability of markets um, during their regular business hours, which means after hours or before hours um, in, in the case of the U.S. markets. But it becomes very challenging when you think about uh, something where the underlying is not trading. So um, there's very strong correlation between the index futures, which, as I mentioned, do trade uh, pretty well, uh, 24 uh, hours a day, um, five and a half days a week. Um, maybe there are two dozen underlying equities that there's some activity in uh, after hours. Uh, there are a number of chain of challenges related to financing. Um, Fedwire, of course, is open from uh, 9.30 at night until uh, about 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So you can actually move money around. People previously thought that was an impediment. Challenges, the banking system doesn't really have uh, financing uh, coverage during uh, all of those extended hours at this point in time. So I do see, uh, and obviously from the perspective of OCC, we have no issue in uh, processing as uh, whatever hours people um, trade. Um, but I, I do think we will see more activity for uh, the largely popular index options and a limited number of ETFs 
but I think it'll be at least a couple of years before we see um, any sort of significant volume in the uh, fungible um, single name options. Uh, that's that's just a guess on my part, um, but I think there are a number of uh, of impediments to that currently. So SPY and SPX in the near future, Apple and Tesla probably down the road a little bit. That's what I would imagine, yes. The other question, John, I am legally obligated to ask you is we have a lot of new listeners uh, coming on and they're used to putting up their trades and their trade is executed in microseconds now, right? So their execution experience is very quick, very robust, and, and they like that. And maybe they're trading on the crypto side where they see a lot of quick trades as well. And then when they look at starting to track the trades in the options market, and then they realize, oh, the open interest doesn't change until it doesn't update except for once a day. So they always ask us, why can I execute a trade in a fraction of a second? And then it takes a whole 24 hours for that OI to update. I know you and I have chatted about this before. You've been working on some of the infrastructure. What do you want to say to our listeners who maybe are curious? Will we see perhaps maybe even like a midday update for OI going forward or something to extend or perhaps accelerate the the 24-hour refresh that we have now? So there are a couple of impediments to that. Um, one is technology. We are currently in a largely batch-oriented uh, environment, and we publish open interest for all 1.6 million uh, strike prices at the same time, as you say, uh, once a day. Um, we are in the process of uh, completely rebuilding our technology, uh, the so-called Encore clearing system, which has served the industry very well for 22 years, is going to be replaced by a much more modern, much closer to real-time system that we've now uh, determined will be called Ovation because you always have an Ovation after an Encore, uh, before an Encore as well, but uh, can't go back in history. Um, so Ovation will give us the ability to do this pretty seamlessly. But there's another piece of the puzzle, and that is in every options transaction, with the exception of the market makers who are about half of the volume, um, but, but they're, they're always uh, net, we need the investors, uh, broker-dealers, the executing brokers, the clearing brokers – to tell us whether a particular transaction is to open a new position or to close an existing position. And unless you have a good handle on those so-called open-close indicators, you don't really know what the open interest is until after the close. There are a number of things that are um, increasing the ability of the industry to provide us uh, more timely open-close indicators. And it's not so much a retail investor uh, issue because the retail investor essentially knows what he or she is doing um, prior to execution. It's particularly important for large institutional investors who are doing a, uh, a set of block transactions for multiple beneficial owners. And across those multiple beneficial owners, some may be open, some may be closed. So if I did a 5,000 contract uh, transaction for a set of managed accounts, it's not until after execution and I break down that block into the individual um, beneficial owner accounts that I really can say what the open or close was for um, each of those uh, con constituent uh, transactions that made up the block. So it's those kind of complications that aren't really technology per se, but a little more, if you will, business practice that impede an accurate uh, open interest calculation uh, on either a real time or a, a multiple time during the day. But I think everybody understands the benefit of that. Uh, certainly, if you think about market makers who are you know, the most real-time focused risk managers in the industry, they're always on top of what their net position is, what was opening, what was closing, uh, what they're going to try to hold to maturity, et cetera. So it's doable. 
but we have to change some some fundamental business practices and and get better data at the offset. I think everybody is of a mind to to get it done. Um, it's a question of when reality will set in and we'll we'll be able to answer those questions. You really do not want to publish inaccurate open interest. That would not be a service to uh, the investing public, I don't think at all. It's the first do no harm principle exactly. of clearing. <laughs> well, you mentioned your your Ovation technology platform overhaul. You guys are in the midst of that right now. Give our listeners some insight into that. What is the time frame for that? And what are you looking to upgrade under the hood there, John? So <clears throat> we're really upgrading the uh, entire infrastructure. Um, we currently have, uh, as I mentioned, a batch-oriented uh, mainframe uh, dependent uh uh, architecture, which is uh, very resilient and uh, very volume insensitive. It hasn't had any trouble at all handling the hockey stick in volume, but it's not particularly flexible. It takes us quite a while to uh, support new products that exchanges uh, come up with. It doesn't give our clearing members the level of service that uh, they and we would like. So among the things that we will do uh, relatively early is uh, provide the ability to do so-called what-if margining. So I'm going to get – I'm a clearing member. I'm going to get a new customer in. Uh, she's got a big portfolio. I want to understand what that portfolio is going to do to my overall uh, customer clearing uh, omnibus account. Send all of those positions into us and we will give you what the margin would look like if, in fact, you took that portfolio in and applied it to your, um, to your overall uh, clearing portfolio at the customer level. Other CCPs around the world have the ability to do that. We don't yet. Um, we hope that will be an early uh, 2023 uh, implementation. We'll be publishing all of our uh, new changed interface requirements, which we're trying to minimize uh, in, in the middle of this summer. So all of our clearing members have the lead time to do their own development prioritization so that when we start testing in 2023, I have about a year of testing to do with clearing members when you make this fundamental a change to our underlying technology, they'll be, they'll be ready to go. We change not only the clearing uh, interfaces and, and make everything more real-time. We uh, will be implementing, after we go live, a series of so-called APIs so that instead of going into a terminal that's connected into uh, the Encore clearing system, you just send us your data, receive the data back, put it into your own format, uh, much more flexible than the current environment. We're changing uh, the whole architecture of our risk and margin calculations. All of this will be uh, so-called code complete. So the actual development uh, will be finished in the toward the end of the uh, second quarter of 2023. And then we will move into this rigorous testing process. Obviously, we're testing now as we get particular components uh, built. But you have to test the entire system as it works together, and you have to test all the weird things that have happened in the market. The stock market crash in 1987, the meme stock uh, issues in 2021 all have to be brought through that, that new environment. So it's, it's going quite well. As with any other big technology project, it ebbs and flows, and certain parts get behind, and certainly the uh, – the marketplace for technology talent right now is quite challenging, and uh, we are we are uh, hiring. We have uh, a number of uh, suppliers that uh, help us out in that regard, and uh, overall, we have uh, I think good success from uh, developing the core uh, fundamentals of what we need. But a big piece of what we want to do, in addition to just changing the software is changing the environment in which that software runs. And that's a move to the so-called public cloud. And to do that, we need to have regulatory approval. 
uh, after the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, there's a process known as the advanced notice process where if we're going to significantly change the risk profile of the OCC, it doesn't matter whether we're going to make it significantly better or something might make it significantly uh, less good, we have to request regulatory approval from the Securities and Exchange Commission as well as the staff of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. We have uh, in October made a formal filing to move our environment, processing environment to uh, the cloud. Um, we think we get a lot more resiliency from the way public cloud architecture is designed. We'll be in two different regions uh, of the, the cloud provider's environment in three different uh, so-called availability zones within each region. So essentially six levels of backup uh, that can be implemented uh, very, very quickly. And then to make sure we don't have uh, total um, exposure to a single provider, we have our own data center, which will really be the seventh level of backup in the event that the cloud provider uh, goes down completely for some reason. It's never happened, but we have to manage fat tails as a, as a CCP. Um, we've been very proactive with the regulators in They've asked us a lot of good questions. We've made some modifications to our proposal in response to those questions. We continue to work with them. And uh, we should, towards the first week in July, uh, have a response from the regulatory authorities as to whether uh, they're going to be comfortable with us moving to the cloud or whether we're going to have to stay in uh, on-premise so-called data centers. Um, the challenge with that is because of the uh, supply chain issues, we would need to start building out a uh, an, an additional data center uh, for these purposes if we're not going to the cloud and order all the hardware um, in the late part of the summer, around the uh, first week or so in September. So there is some uh, time criticality uh, with respect to that. But um, so far, the process is, is going quite well. So like any other big technology project, as I said, there, there are bumps in the road. And though you have to manage those bumps in the road. Um, we try to be very transparent with our clearing members about minimizing the effects on them, uh, understanding from the exchange's perspective what their needs are. Uh, we're in the not too distant future going to have a 17th option exchange uh, in this uh, uh, in, in our industry. Um, so all of these things are uh, quite challenging to continue to manage, but we've got a really good team of people and uh, get very, very good guidance and oversight from our, our board of directors. So hopefully, John, by the time you and I sit down together at this conference next year, we'll have more insight into how the Ovation uh, platform is rolling out, John. Absolutely, we will. And I want to circle back to something you said earlier in our conversation about volume. One of the questions we've been polling everyone on ever since this pandemic kicked off and the volume, as you mentioned, the hockey stick started shooting north there, certainly coming into 2021. And again, this year, we've been polling a lot of our guests and our regular co-hosts about, about whether they think this party, this volume explosion can continue. And certainly for last year, as you mentioned, it did. It hit nearly 10 billion contracts there at OCC. But it sounds like from your comments earlier, you don't think we're going to hit that close to 10 billion level again this year. I'm curious why you think that and what kind of volume numbers we'll be looking at for this year, John. Well, I think we'll be pretty close, but I think uh, we will not have the sort of double-digit growth in volume that we've seen the past two years. That's not necessarily a bad thing, actually. Um, but we, we see, uh, and there have been a couple of panels on that at, at the conference here, uh, more return to the market by institutional investors. Uh, that's certainly a, a positive thing. And retail volume is not increasing at the rate it was, but it's not exactly vanishing either. So I do think we uh, are, are, are going to see an era of uh, uh, slower growth, but I don't think we're going to see uh, the kinds of declines in volume that we saw in, in the financial crisis. Um, there's a lot of risks out there. 
And these are very useful risk management products that uh, risk transfer products that uh, the options industry has and uh, continues to develop. I I don't think we'd have uh, a 17th uh, options exchange moving into uh, the market. I mean, got a perfectly fine franchise in cash equities. You don't move into uh, another more complicated market. You know, they're going to trade all the fungible names. Well, uh, they don't have quite all the 1.6 million uh, uh, strike prices to deal with, but they've got probably 1.3 or 1.4 million of those to deal with. All those, I think, are positive signs, but I, I would see growth uh, slowing a bit. And, and we can see that. We had um, 260 million plus contract days on a successive Friday and Monday uh, in January of this year. Um, but we're in the sort of uh, high 30s to mid 40s million contracts of late. And I, I think that's a good good steady state for the industry. And, uh, and of course, the volatility continues. I haven't looked at the market since we've been in here, but you know, we had another day where we opened higher and are moving lower. Um, uh, and obviously, that changes from uh, name to name with respect to the single stocks. But there's a lot going on and uh, some, some new phenomena in the economy with respect to uh, inflation, uh, some new phenomena in the geopolitical uh, world with respect to uh, particularly the war in the Ukraine. And all of these, I think, make people a bit more uh, conservative, uh, a little less uh, rah-rah, let's go out and trade, and and a little more thoughtful about, you know, what are the risks that I want to manage? What's the best strategy for protecting my portfolio uh, against things that might happen that um, we hadn't seen in, uh, in, in, in a few years? Well, John, it's been great to see you face to face again. I appreciate you taking some time out of your conference here to fill our listeners in on the latest developments over there at OCC. But before we go, if there's anything you forgot to mention, or perhaps you've already given us some interesting teases, but if you want to leave our listeners with anything else, any interesting teases about what's coming down the pike from OCC, now is the time, John. The floor is yours. Okay, I'll give you two interesting Ooh, two. teases. One is, you know, as I mentioned at the offset, I think the work that you guys do in terms of investor education is particularly important. One of the things we've done that we haven't been able to do for about a dozen years is we've completely rewritten uh, the options disclosure document, the sort of fundamental prospectus that underlies and explains to investors all of the risks and the characteristics of these options. It's much more readable than it was. We need to move that into something that is consumable on your mobile phone. That is something we're working on, uh, just making and, and collaborating with our clearing members and, and people like yourself to enhance investor education. There are an awful lot of new investors in this market. That's a good thing, but it's a better thing if they understand all the risks and characteristics of what they're trading. The other thing, of course, is uh, there's now at least a preliminary thought that uh, the underlying uh, cash markets for uh, U.S. corporate securities will move to a so-called uh, T plus one settlement environment uh, away from the current T plus two. That does a whole bunch of interesting things in terms of how expirations work, how exercises work, uh, when people have to have their uh, order allocations in and the the linkages between the derivative markets and the underlying cash markets, uh, which will occupy the industry's attention uh, quite a bit for, for the next couple of years, uh, just the financing consequences of thinking about that. It clearly reduces overall settlement risk, but we've got to make sure we're very thoughtful about how we get there. I lied. One more thing, John, before we go. You mentioned the expirations. We are seeing this push towards effectively daily expirations. We're already there in the SPX. We have a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday expiration. There is some interest slash consternation at a conference like this about adding that to single names. Do we need to have an Apple expiring every day of the week or Tesla? I'm curious. What are your thoughts on this continued proliferation of expirations? 
Look, I, I think um, – this is a pretty complicated topic. It's very straightforward for ETFs and for uh, index options. The challenge with single names is there are corporate actions on single names. And do you really want to have a corporate action on exactly the same day as an expiration? And uh, that's very challenging uh, investment bankers get paid a lot of money to think of new and more elaborate uh, corporate actions. Dividends used to be highly predictable. Now there are all sorts of special dividends that come out. Working through the challenges associated with corporate actions are the biggest non-cyber risk that uh, OCC faces in terms of we have to make uh, very quick, very correct, very timely decisions about how to adjust options for particular kinds of corporate actions. Having more expirations and more complexity around those I think is a challenge at this point in time. I'm sure the industry will be able to work it out, but it, it will take some time and, and some focus and concentration. So great for ETFs, great for uh, index options where there aren't generally corporate actions, um, but challenging for, uh, for the single names. Well, John, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to chat with our listeners. And we'll look forward to seeing how Ovation and all these other new upgrades over there at OCC, how they unfold in the marketplace in the coming months. Great. Thank you for the time. Really appreciate it. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 